I want to say welcome to the guy, uh, guys from the prison. Thank you for joining us. Welcome to all the people online, and thank you for being here with us. Uh, we are in a series called Phone Zombies. I've been hearing some things that people don't like it. Some people love it. It is a difficult uh, subject to talk about our habits and our habits on social media, technology, all those things that are uh, consuming our lives more and more and more. And uh, we hope that we can help you with some of the habits that are bad and maybe some of those good habits that we can continue to help uh, make better and better. So I want to give you a visual about the subject I'm going to be talking today because this subject is something that I've dealt with most of my life. And, but I want to, I'm going to tell a lot of jokes and try to be funny because that's kind of how I am. So imagine I'm sitting at the coffee bar, it's the end of second service, trying to have coffee with somebody. Uh, some volunteers haven't shown up. They're sick this morning. You know, they called five minutes before they're having a rough morning. Coffee pots aren't working. Coffee makers aren't working. There's coffee all over. And I'm sitting there drinking my coffee and this kid comes up, taps me on the shoulder, and look at him like, Hey, that was a kid that had like donuts on his fingers. He looked like a globetrotter, just three or four of those bad boys. So he's got frosting splashed across his face like war paint. He's got some orange juice all over his shirt. And he goes, excuse me, mister, do you know we're out of donuts? And I'm like, yeah, we'll have more donuts next week. Come back next week. But inside, I'm feeling a lot like this. This is Sparta! Poor kid. I know, it's stupid. Have you guessed what we're going to talk about this morning? Anger. Yes, anger is my old friend. I remember it started earlier on uh, in my house. For whatever reason, I saw my parents deal with the relationship, with parenting, and some different different things in their life with anger. And they didn't always do that. It was just what I perceived. And for some reason, I took that on. And I have to say, my parents were wonderful. I loved, I look back at my childhood and I loved how I grew up. I loved my parents. But for whatever reason, man, it, I just took a hold of that. Anger became part of me and I could see that there was strength in it. Have you, did anybody have any parents that they'd get a medical bill and the insurance didn't pay anything? My dad would set up snacks and coffee, and he'd get on the phone for hours and hours. He'd just be yelling at them, telling them that they're going to pay this and they're going to pay that. And I thought, man, that's really powerful. That's strong. I want that. And so growing up, it became more and more of a problem. And I'll tell you a story about that a little later. But uh, in high school, my dad recognized that I became kind of cold and calloused. I was able to say whatever I wanted to people, and I wasn't scared about how they reacted. And he said, you know, Zach, this is becoming a problem, and you should really watch this. Unfortunately, we didn't get the opportunity to get in the Bible and talk about, you know, what God says, what Paul says, and all those things. And that's what I want to do with you today. I want to get into the Bible and talk about um, some of these bad things. Can we go to Ephesians 4? So Paul's talking to the Ephesus church, and this is becoming a problem, anger. So he wants to talk to the Ephesians church about anger. And he says, do not sin by letting anger control you. And that's, that's what we're talking about today anger and how it can control you. Don't let the sun go down while you're still angry, for anger gives a foothold for the Denver, for the devil, excuse me. So don't let anger control you. We can have anger. Be angry. Don't let it control you. And don't let the sun go down while you're still angry. He's talking about a time frame here. Don't be angry for too long because once you're too long or once you're angry for too long, it allows the devil to work inside of that anger. And if we allow the devil to work inside of that anger, we start sinning and we start doing doing those things that we shouldn't be doing. You go ahead and go to the next slide. Sorry. So what makes you angry? That's the question I want to know. It's a great question. Does anybody have kids here? Has anybody dropped your kids off at school? Who designed those parking lots? Am I right? There's always that dude driving right down the middle. Everybody's flipping him off. He don't care. And then he doesn't even pick up a kid. He just, it's like, what was that guy here for? He just saw a bunch of people here, so he came in, seeing what you guys were doing. So I want to tell you what kind of makes me angry. Just, this is one of those things. Um, I love being a man, so men kind of make me angry. I look around the world, and I see men taking advantage of their wives, of their kids, of their money, their power. You know, men are given a gift. You know what I'm saying, men? There's a lot of men out here like, we're in church. We can't be doing this. But I'll give you a 10 to 2 man, Taylor, bro. 
wife punching him in the shoulder. So John Tyson said something really amazing. I thought this was great in one of his books. He said, one of the enemy's greatest strategies is destroying fathers. The devil knows if he can get rid of the father, he can destroy the family. Women are amazing. And women have been going at it at, uh, alone for all these years. But men, you have such power. You have a gift to protect, to lead. But when we let anger into that, we don't lead. We don't protect. We destroy. We do all those things we shouldn't be doing. So what happened? I was angry about men. Me and Mitch started getting together. Yeah, the goofball up on the TV. Um, we started getting together and talking. And we started talking about how we can grow as fathers, how we can grow as husbands, how we can grow. And he wasn't married at the time, but he was, he was big about this. And so we decided to share this with other men. We, did, we got a bunch of guys together made a men's life group, and it is brilliant. These guys are learning so much, and they make a big deal about what a man should look like. And I thought that was so powerful because I thought I was going to lead this, but you should come to our life group. I have leaders. Every single man in my group is a leader, and I love them. So what if I told you in Gillette, Wyoming, that there are 1,200 kids each weekend that don't have access to food? Does that make you a little bit upset inside? Is that righteous anger coming up? And you're saying, we should do something about this, right? Well, years ago, Tama Clapper from Living Rock Church, she heard the same thing. She was upset. She was angry. She's like, God, what, what can I do about this? So she started researching. She started putting her time into looking for what programs are out there. And she came across this national organization called Blessings in a Backpack. And she opened our own chapter here in Gillette, Wyoming. And so for years and years now, we've been able to feed kids on the weekends. You, this church, has been able to donate your time, your money. And so this thing that makes us angry, she took it and allowed God to make something beautiful out of it. You take your righteous anger and allow God to lead you into something beautiful. She could have gone the other way and been angry, been mad, spewing all over social media or wherever else she could have. But instead, she took that and made it something beautiful. So because we're in this phone zombies series, I think it would be very important for us to talk about technology, right? I, I'm talking a lot about the stuff that bothers me. I'm not too bad on social media, but there have been times. Um, so some of you are like, Zach, I don't get angry at people. I don't talk about people. I'm not, I'm not mean to people. But there are some of you who get behind a TV screen or a phone screen or a computer screen, and all of a sudden things change looks a little more, more like this. <laughs> Technology is frustrating, isn't it? Oh my gosh. It's ridiculous. Technology has given us a pass on being gentle with our words, with our emotions. You know, we want to be right. And so when we get on social media and we find something that we don't agree with, we start posting and we start sharing, we start disliking, liking, whatever you're going to do. And we're just not gentle. It's not like a face-to-face -face conversation. And some people feel like, well, because we're not face-to-face -face and I might never see you, it doesn't really matter what I say or do, right? Maybe I do see you and I say, Hey, that was online. That's not me. That's my online persona. That doesn't really matter. But it does matter. Every word that you say, every, every word that you post out there, may, it's, it's a big deal. and affects people in a big way. So we have to be careful about how we post on, on, on social media. We have to be careful about how we spend our time on social media. If you're looking at things on social media that constantly make you angry, it's probably not a great way to spend it. But... We have, to, we have to admit at some point that social media can dictate our emotions. It's a social online aspect, just as we are sitting here today. So if social media is dictating your emotions, we should be careful about how we spend our time on that. And to be honest with you, every single one of us, anytime you get on social media, it is kind of dictating your emotions. You're looking for something fun. You're looking for something maybe to make you happy. But a lot of times we find things that make us upset or angry. So imagine... You're a uh, Pepsi person like my wife is, for whatever reason, I don't know what the difference is, but you love Pepsi, right? But you're scrolling through and you see this really cool Coke commercial and you stay for just a second too long 
And then the rest of your feed is just filled with Coke commercials. But you love Pepsi, so it ticks you off, right? But what if you're a dog lover? You love dogs. You hate cats, right? But then this cat shows up. You know what I mean? You got to take a second to look at that. <laughs> Guys, can you take that off? That's horrible. And then that shows up on your feet constantly. These algorithms are learning about what ticks you, what hits your button. And when they find that, they know what you're supposed to, what they, what they need to feed you. It's like a meat grinder. You know what I mean? And then you hear some people, I just saw this post last week, and it's a person I really like, and I'm not making fun of this. I wouldn't make fun of this at all, but I, I, I kind of understand where they're coming from. You see a post from a person, and it says, I don't normally do this, but, and then you're like, oh gosh, here it comes. And then they, <sighs> all over the screen, right? That anger and that frustration, that thing, whatever they were watching just comes spewing out onto the, onto the screen, right? And, and it's probably true. They are probably angry about something, but that is not whatsoever a constructive way. They didn't help anybody. That person they were mad at didn't look at that and go, you know what? That's probably about me. I think I'm going to change my life. And that's what we want, right? That's, that's exactly why we're doing it, but that's not going to help anybody. And I know that a lot of, there, I'm sure there's people here who've done it. I've probably done it, but we have to find more constructive ways of handling our anger. So, I think, let's go back to Paul, because I really like reading uh, Paul's Ephesians, and we're going to read 2, 3, and 4. Paul says, always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other, making allowances for each other's faults because of your love. So each line of this is really going to hit everybody pretty hard here, because this hurts. I love how Paul says, always. Don't sometimes be humble. Mike, I know he's probably watching online, don't be humble just when the Chiefs lose. You have to be humble when the Chiefs win too, right, Mike? It's my little poke for Mike. Be patient with one another. Guys, give each other time. Be patient. Make allowances for each other's faults. That's the one that's really hard. Guys, we're going to screw up. Other people are going to screw up. We have to give them space to screw up because that's what, that's what God does for us. That's the grace that God gives us. So we have to also be like Christ and give them some space. Let's go to three make every, every effort to keep yourself united with the Spirit. Unite yourself with God. Stay united. Binding yourself together with peace. I love that. He's not saying bind yourself together with knowledge. Bind yourself together when you're all right, when you all believe the same things. Bind yourself together with peace. Let's go to four. For there is one body and one Spirit just as you have been called to one glorious hope for the future. So there's one body. Do you guys realize that not this just this church, but every church in Gillette, every church in the nation, every church in the world, we are the body. It's not just this church. We are the body, every one of us. And so we, one body, for one spirit, our God, just as you've been called to one glorious hope, we're all going for one direction. We're all trying to lead to Christ. We're all trying to do this thing together. So I'd ask you, should we be controlled by anger or should we allow the Holy Spirit to guide us? Should we allow the Holy Spirit to control us? And I hate the word control, and I know everybody here does. We grow up in in America where freedom is the most important thing. But if you allow the Holy Spirit to guide you, can you imagine what your relationships would look like? Your relationships, instead of being broken and torn apart, be built up. Imagine what you would be like at work when you hate your boss, you hate your coworkers, your boss hates you, and you're just building each other up. And you can be the worker who says, yes, boss, I'll do whatever you want. You hired me. And with a smile on your face, you could just continually be the, the kind of worker that you would want. What about your family life? You know, when I was, when I was so angry at the coal mine, I would come home, and my, my family didn't know what kind of Zach they were getting. They didn't know if I was going to be angry. They didn't know if I was going to be happy. And they were always walking on eggshells. And that is really when I, I looked at myself, and I was like, man, what am I doing? What's going on in here that hurts so bad that I have to be angry enough to make my family scared of when I come home? 
And so that's, that's when I started going on this journey with Mitch and with the pastors and the staff. And I started reading more and I started learning more. And I, I was just telling Karen the other day because we were talking about anger. And she wanted, to, she wanted to talk through the sermon a little bit and just see, you know, what I was talking about. And she said, well, what's the difference between frustration and anger? I said, well, a person who's controlled by anger is nonstop frustrated. You just, you just walk around frustrated. You're not angry until so, somebody says something. But you're just, your constant state of being is frustrated with everything and anything. And that's, that's, what, that's what I was like. So for my, my wife and my family, so that was a really difficult time. So I want to talk about, and I think this is, this will be my last story. I think this, this story would be amazing because Jesus in his last hours, in his last days, it was, it was probably the most frustrating thing we can see out of the Bible. Let's go to there, Matthew 26. There you go. And so Jesus had just got done having the last supper with his disciples. He went to the garden to pray to his father. He had a couple of disciples with him. And now he's just walking out of the garden. 47 says, and even as Jesus said this, Judas, one of the 12 disciples, arrived with a crowd of men armed with swords and clubs. So Judas is one of the handpicked disciples. He's one of the 12. This isn't just a nobody. This is one of Jesus' brothers, one of the ones he spent his ministries with. And they had been sent by the leading priests and elders of the people, the leading priests, the people who were supposed to welcome Christ, who were supposed to be happy that I was there. These leading priests are following and making everybody else follow the laws that God gave them, the covenants. The traitor Judas had even given them a prearranged signal. You will know which one to rest when I greet him with a kiss. Your best friend is about to sell you out. And he's telling them, I'll kiss him so that you know. So Judas came straight up to Jesus. Greetings, Rabbi. Can you see that exclamation mark there? It's like your best friend coming up. Hey, brother, I'm glad to see you. How are you? He exclaimed and gave him a kiss. And then your best friend kisses you. And you know that you're about to be put to death because of this person. My friend, Jesus, still being humble and gentle and loving my friend, I'll greet you the same way. Go ahead and do what you have come for. Then the others grabbed Jesus and arrested him. But one of them, men, with Jesus, pulled out his sword and struck the high priest slave, slashing off his ear. Put away your sword. Jesus rebukes his friend. And you guys all know how this feels. You would always say, I would die for my friend. And Peter's saying, I will die for you, Jesus. You can't leave now. We're not done. This thing is not done yet. Why? I can't let you go. And Jesus says, that's not how we're doing this thing. Those who use the sword will die by the sword. Don't you realize that I could ask my father for thousands of angels to protect us? Jesus right now realizes he could scorch the whole earth by calling his father's angels down. But he says, angels to protect us, he would send, go ahead, Mitch. He would send them instantly. But if I did, how would the scriptures be fulfilled that describe must happen now? Jesus realizes the intense amount of pain and anger, and he realizes that also his father loves him, and he has given him all this power to do whatever he needs to do. Let's go to the next slide, Mitch. No, next one. With Jesus. How can Jesus keep his cool? Imagine all those feelings, your best friend, the, the high priest, all these things that are going on inside of him, and Jesus is just cool as a cucumber. Let's go to Matthew 26. I think you were just there, sorry. This is, this is right before Judas meets him. He went down a little, or excuse me, he went on a little farther and bowed with his head, faced the ground, praying, my father, if it is possible, let this cup of suffering be taken away from me. Yet, I want your will to be done, not mine. Jesus is scared. He's human, but he's God. But he knows that this is going to be a suffering. This is going to be so impossible for him to be able to handle. How else can I handle this? And throughout Jesus' ministry, he always goes and talks to the Father. So before he's going to die, he goes and asks Jesus, or goes and asks God, 
Yahweh, would you give me the power? Would you give me, would you keep me humble? Would you keep me uh, powerful? I think there's so much power in being humble and gentle and loving. And God grants it to him. But he also says, God, could you take this cup from me? Because I know what's about to happen. They're about to beat me. They're about to embarrass me and make fun of me, spit on me, even the religious leaders. And then they're going to take me to the cross and I'm going to die. And so all those feelings inside of him, he's so scared what he's going to do next. You know what I mean? But the father, the father gives him power. Do you have another slide, Mitch? There you go. So I think we should remember that we are the body of Christ. Remember that some of these people that you're talking to online, remember these people that you are seeing that uh, drive and make you mad? We are all the body of Christ. We have to treat them with respect and love. And these are your brothers and sisters of Christ. This is all the people that we're doing the same mission with, trying to spread the gospel. So this week, I'd love to challenge you guys a little bit. Because I think this series has been so much fun because there's a lot of applications to what we can do to make our habits better. So my challenge would be, I have a couple. I challenge you to give people some space. Give some allowances for people's sins, for their bad things, for the things that they do to you that might make you mad. And I know that might feel contradictory. That might feel like, hey, I'm, I'm kind of feeding into their bad habits if I'm giving them allowances. But it says always give allowances to others. So give people some space. Give them some grace and show them some love. I challenge you to be gentle with people, men especially. Be gentle with each other. Be gentle with your children. Be gentle with your wives, your girlfriends, the women around you. Work on being gentle. A lot of men will say, hey, I'm a tough guy. Like, there is no gentleness in me. And that's not true. If you're going to follow Christ, I promise you, he will continue to make you more of a gentle person. And also, I'd ask you to, I would challenge you to be humble and patient with each other. And that's a, that's a really hard one for me because being humble, being patient, I always want to jump into action, jump on whatever situation's going on. But if you can sit back and take your time and look over the situation or look over people and just listen, just be patient and be humble. Maybe you're not always right and maybe you are right, but maybe it doesn't even matter. Maybe it's more about the relationship than that. So I thank you guys for listening to me. I want to pray over the congregation because I know that there are people out here who deal with anger. I know there's a ton of people out here who have faced the same things I have, who have been controlled by anger, and they feel like they're in chains because that's what I felt like. I was in chains for years and years. And now that I taste the, the freedom of Christ, I would love for you guys to have that too. So let's pray together. God, thank you for this opportunity to become, just come before you, God, in a congregation of people who love you, who want to serve you, who want the best. And God, I pray that you, you lay your blessing over this congregation, God, that you would take our anger from us, you wouldn't allow it to control us, God, that we could seek and be in this world, which is humbleness and patience and love. Guys, that's what you designed us to be, God. We thank you so much for this morning. I pray for these people in your name. Amen.